Je voudrais passer la parole à Madame euh, Juliette Toakli. Vous avez la parole, Madame Toakli. Merci. Merci, Monsieur le Président. I'm going to speak in English. And I would also... Est-ce qu'on a traduction dans la salle? I would also... Je... Shall I continue? Yeah. Do, do we have translation? Bon, on va se débrouiller, on va comprendre. Allez-y. Vous avez la parole. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so thank you. I also was uh, very heartened to see Africa in a plenary session at the beginning of this year's uh, World Policy Conference. It was very heartening. Sorry, can you hear me? Okay. And as already alluded to, the global health crisis and poverty are pushing a green and digital transformation in Africa. Uh, yesterday, a speaker stated that the climate wars would be won in Lagos, Delhi, and Bogota, not Brussels. That really resonated with me because, in fact, I think that is very much the case. The impact of having shortages of energy and inequities I apologize, Mrs. Twakli. Uh, I, I would like. Are you interpreters? No. Hmm? Il y a. Ah, well, ah, but that's not everybody. Okay. <laughs> ah, d'accord, okay, okay. It's not everyone. Ah, euh, il y a des interprètes, donc vous pouvez prendre yeah. les écouteurs sur le canal 3. Ceux qui sont francophones peuvent entendre directement. Merci. Donc je remets le compteur à, à zéro pour Madame Toaki que j'ai interrompu. <rire> Again, voilà. I Go would ahead. like to extend my pleasure at uh, seeing Africa on, in a plenary session at the beginning of the World Policy Conference yesterday. That was very heartening. Um, but as has uh, been stated uh, by other members, the global health crisis and poverty are pushing a green and digital transformation in Africa. I, then I felt yesterday when a speaker stated that climate wars are to be won in Lagos, Delhi and Bogota, not Brussels, he hit the nail on the head. The impact of there being inequitable distribution of energy and shortage of energy on health and education is considerable in our continent. An estimated 600 million persons in Africa have had no experience of electricity. That is half of the entire population of Africa. In addition, there is a growing recognition of our vulnerability to climate shocks and their impact on our youth livelihoods, both present and in the future. There is still a considerable dependence on rain-fed agriculture and pastoralism, and these are essential to food production and security in much of the continent. In addition, energy shortages are also fueling a growing drive for greater access to both electricity and clean energy. Of note, our energy poverty is not homogenous. For example, in South Sudan, there is only 5% of the population that have access to electricity, compared to South Africa, where it is 80% access, and in the country that I reside, Ghana, we also have about 80% of our population with access to electricity. But the prospects are slim for expansion or expansion of access to grid-based electricity each year. And yet our energy consumption will double, in fact it will be it'll more than double over the next 20 years, being driven by a growing per capita income, increased and very rapid urbanization, continued economic transformation, and a minimum predicted 50% population increase for our already 1.2 billion population, 
which puts us in a, a larger situation than even India, as was mentioned earlier today. Sub-Saharan Africa has both a vastly greater energy potential for solar and to a lesser extent wind power. I won't go into the reasons for that, but we also have lower renewable energy infrastructural costs. Renewable energy options appear particularly viable for our off-grid, remote, or isolated areas where electricity access remains a real and pressing challenge. I fully expect that we will leapfrog to distributed energy systems much the way that we leapfrogged we leapfrogged, yes, or skipped over land-based telephone lines to cellular phones. But in the absence of private investors creating innovative investment financing, businesses and households will continue to resort to small-scale fossil fuel power from coal to kerosene or from diesel to gasoline, the consequences of which, to quote Winston Churchill the second time today, would be too ghastly to contemplate. The growth in our energy and electricity demands does, however, present extraordinary op economic opportunity for financing mechanisms that go beyond the traditional public-private finance models that we are used to, alongside multilateral assistance and developmental assistance opportunities. Some of these opportunities would be coming from the African Development Bank and from the African diaspora. The African Development Bank has just agreed to partner with WHO on an Africa Connect initiative that will strategically tap into African diasporans' investments into health and infrastructure on the continent. I think it is well for us to remember that the official development assistance to Africa in 2021 stood at $35 billion, but this was a mere 36% of what the diaspora remittances were. They stood at $95.6 billion, with Egypt and Nigeria being the particular uh, donors, I think, of at least 50% of all remittances into the continent, providing almost a form of concessional financing. So this new initiative is particularly important for us and for any African-led financing initiatives that address both our clean energy and our electricity needs, which are particularly essential to our health and education. Thank you. Merci, Madame Tuaki.